Revelation chapter number 11. You'll remember last week we ended with what I called an interlude between the sixth trumpet and the seventh. Now the seventh doesn't take place in this chapter. Uh, we, we, we're, we're still carrying on, but we're getting some backstory here in this chapter. If you, I mean, you can go over to the book of Daniel. I believe it's chapter number twelve. You're going to find a timeline of the end times where he's. That's where people, when they're talking about a bear from the north and the whelps of the lion, that's Daniel's prophecy of the end times. The nations that are going to be involved, the timeline, don't be confused by the fact that Daniel says it's three and a half weeks of, you know, peace, three and a half weeks of wartime, seven weeks total. He got part of a prophecy, part of a vision. Right? He interpreted what he saw. If you'll remember, Daniel had a knack for reading dreams. Right? What, what God showed him is what he reported. Right? He was hindered by the fact that, one, he's got a mind like you and me, and he doesn't have a mind like God. And two, God also revealed what God wanted people to know. The prophecy that Daniel received was for God's people to warn them of the time of Jacob's trouble. Right? We refer to that as the Great Tribulation, but it is the gathering of the wheat and the tares and God throws the tares into the fire and he saves the wheat the end times is to purify God's people Israel right? never lose sight of that but when we get to the book of Revelation John who's called up to see it in the flesh he didn't receive a vision he didn't receive a dream right? he saw it Now there's conjecture, really, who's to say who's right? But does not the Bible say that no man can see God and live? Didn't John tell us what he looked like in the beginning of the chapter? I believe that when it says that he fell as a dead man, for a little bit there, God took him out of the body to show him some things that he could only see in the spirit. Then God brought him back. You say, can God do that? God can do whatever he wants to. But when John saw it, twice in this chapter and the next, he gets very specific periods of time. And in truth, although I believe that John's account is true, people say that the Great Tribulation is going to last for seven years. That's what we believe based on the Bible. But if John's using time measurements like Daniel, and he's just making sense of what he saw. I don't know how long it's going to last. Who does, God? Who knows when it's going to start, the Father, because the Son doesn't even know. Who knows when it's going to end, God? But I do believe that if you rightly divide the Word of God, you're going to get seven years. But in chapter number 11, at the beginning, we're going to begin reading verse number 1. It says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles. In the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. You do your math, that's three and a half years. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. What's that? That's twelve hundred and sixty days. You do the math, if you divide by thirty, that's three and a half years. Okay? But it says they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Let's stop here. Now, John's given a reed, or back in those days they used a reed or a rod as a ruler. Okay, way back when, 
Y'all remember all the measurements that God gave to Moses and he said cubits? Well, a cubit was a unit of measurement. That was from your elbow to your fingertips. That's why you can never really know how big the ark was because I don't know how big Moses, or Noah's arm was. Right? Because that's, that's what he built it off of was his cubit. Now they estimate and they guess, but nobody really knows. It was standardized at some point between the Egyptians and the Babylonians and everybody else. But again, I wasn't alive back then. I don't know how big that is. How big is this rod that John's going to go and measure with? It's going to be the size that God wanted that rod to be. Okay, keep that in mind. We, we don't know what he's using to measure, but God gave him the measuring stick. And he was told to go measure, it says, the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship therein. Right now, there is no temple, per se, in Jerusalem. There's the Dome of the Rock, that's what the Muslims put up, on top of the mountain where Solomon's temple used to be. There is a wall that still remains of Solomon's temple. They call it the weeping wall or the wailing wall. It's where they go to pray and they write prayers on pieces of paper and put them into the wall. It's just a problem. They're not praying the way that the Bible says you need to pray. They're still under Old Testament economy, a lot of them. There's no power in that wall any more than there is power in the drywall we got around here. But it is a symbol of what? Of Israel's golden age. When God was on their side, when they lived right, and when God allowed them to build an edifice for the Lord to dwell in, that by all accounts was the most elaborate, most decorative, and the most expensive building, if we account for inflation and everything else, that's ever been built. The most beautiful thing ever created by human hands, and it was dedicated unto God so that God would have a place among his people. And then it was destroyed. Then it was rebuilt. And then it was destroyed. And that has been the cycle throughout Israel's history, but it's been a very long time since they've had a temple. But I believe that someday soon and very soon, they're going to recreate or build the next one. You say, why is that? Well, they've already got the menorah that's going to go into it. They've already used methods, as prescribed in the Old Testament, to have the candlestick, that's what the Bible calls it, that will go into the new temple. They've already got red heifers that were shipped to them, I believe, from Texas. And they've set them aside right now. Why? Because they have to be inspected. There's one hair on that cow that isn't red. It's not a red heifer, according to God's standards. And they've set them aside. Why? Because they'll need the ashes of a red heifer to purify the priest before they're able to fulfill their priestly duties within the temple. But it exists. When's it built? I don't know. When do they start practicing Old Testament worship? I believe after the church is taken out. But, what's it going to look like? I don't know. He was just told to go measure it. To measure that, to measure the altar. And them that worship therein. Now you say, Brother Jordan, how do you measure people with a stick? Well, you all ever heard of an abacus? It said it was given to him a reed or a rod. You can have things that slide around on that. You know the number that he's going to come up with by the end of it? 144,000. Same number that we already got before. When God said that he went and put his mark into the foreheads of his people. But he measures all of it. Then in verse number 2 it says, But the court that is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles. And the holy city, that's Jerusalem, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Again, three and a half years. I believe that for the first three and a half years, Israel is going to be secluded 
But they're going to be worshiping God in this temple. We believe Old Testament worship comes back into practice. And for three and a half years, the Antichrist and his crowd, they leave them alone. They don't like them, but they haven't begun the purging, so to speak. And then halfway through, after that time of peace, false peace, is over, they move in and they raise the city again. They take over the holy city, Jerusalem. And then those that remain will be whittled down to what? 144,000. They'll be in the wilderness, it says. We'll get to that eventually. But they're driven out. All except two fellows. Verse number 3, it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Keep in mind, this is the Antichrist and his crew. Everything that we've read so far, with the seals and the trumpets, all that's going to be happening while these two fellows are walking around. Okay, but what are they prophesying? Well, prophesying just means they preach them. Even now, after people have bought hook, line, and sinker, what the Antichrist has been preaching and teaching and spreading around the world, after a one world unified government has existed, everyone's already received the mark of the beast, either in their hand or their forehead. Even after all of that, what does God do? He sends two preachers to tell them what God says, what is right. Even when the world is holy, except for 144,000 people in the wilderness, holy, given over to antichrist, devilish, and selfish doctrine, God once again sends two. Not just one, two. Why? Because in the Old Testament it says that you need at least two witnesses in order to take it as fact. So God does it to where they can't even blame them. Well, you didn't send somebody. He sent two of them. What are they going to be saying? The same exact thing. Now again, a lot of debate over who these two fellows are. But if you go, you study everything out, it says that those that had died were in Abraham's bosom, that Jesus, when he died on the cross, when he went to glory, he led that captivity captive. He took all the Old Testament saints with him after they believed on the blood that he shed. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes to us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no purgatory. There's no holding place for your soul. Either you're as the rich man that had Lazarus begging at his gates where when he died he opened his eyes in hell being in torment. Or it's as the Apostle Paul said, you take your last breaths here, you take your first breath in glory. Those are the only two options. But if all of God's people, except for the 144,000 that are in the wilderness on the run from the Antichrist, if all God's people are there, who are these two fellows? Well, our pastor preached on that not too long ago. On that it's appointed unto men once to die. And then the judgment. Jesus told Nicodemus that you were born of flesh, of blood, but you need to be born of water. Well, before you can go to glory, this body of blood needs to die so that your spirit, which was birthed through water, the Holy Ghost, water's a picture of the Word and of the Holy Ghost. You needed both in order to get born again. But that part of you, the new creature, goes on to glory. Well, if you study your Bible, I find that there's two fellows that we never have an account of that died a physical death. You can't go today and mark out where the grave is because they ain't got one. God took them. But why did God take them? For a time and a place and a reason. 
And I believe that these two witnesses, the first would be Enoch from the book of Gen Genesis. It says that Enoch walked with God in the time of the patriarchs. Well, how close was he? One day, he just got so close to God, God said, you coming with me. It says, and God took him. And it gives you how old he was when God took him, but it doesn't say that he died. He was just walking one day and he stepped off to wherever God wanted him to be for the next couple thousand years. Where is that? I don't know. God didn't tell us. But he took him. And then in a very similar manner, one day there was this fellow named Elijah. And he told Elisha, I got some things I got to go do. God says my time's about up. And Elisha says, wherever you go, I'm going. They cross over the river after Elijah smacks it with his coat and it parts for him. And he says, what well, boy, my ride's here. He says, what you talking about? Then a whirlwind of fire took him somewhere. The only thing that was left of him was his coat, which he gave to Elisha. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that God took him somewhere. He didn't die. But you're going to find that after this, that these two fellows end up dying. Why? Because it's appointed unto all men that we die once. God just put them on the back burner for a while and appointed that their time to go was in this chapter. Don't feel sorry for them, though. No. Everything turns out okay. But these two witnesses, what are they going to do? They're going to be preaching up a storm. They thought James and John were the sons of thunder. They haven't met Elisha and Enoch yet. These are men that were so close to God that beforehand, did not Elisha say that he prayed that it wouldn't rain and then God said it's not going to rain for three and a half years? Didn't Elisha build an altar? Prepare the sacrifice on top of the altar? tells them to dump what, for all we know, was all the water that they had left during the middle of this drought on top of the altar. And then he said a little simple prayer. He just said, God, I pray that you be God so that these people know that you are God. That's essentially what he prayed. He said, prove to them that you are who you say you are so that they'll turn from these false prophets and this false doctrine and these idols. What happened? God sent down fire from heaven so hot that it licked up the dust that was around the altar. Then Elijah went and prayed, and he kept praying. And he prayed again until the servant came back and said, I saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And he said, good enough for me. Rain's coming again. And then he was so full of God, he outrained a chariot being pulled by horses all the way back to the city. Well, how close was Enoch to God? Enoch walked with him. You believe what you want to. This is in the time of the patriarchs. I believe God literally came down out of heaven and walked and talked with Enoch. Did he know he was there? Yeah, he knew he was there. He was talking to him. Did he see him? I don't know. The Bible says that God came down in that pillar of cloud leading the Egyptians around in the wilderness. One time cloud came right down to the door of the tabernacle. Moses and Joshua were inside. Joshua was so fearful of what was about ready to happen, he just fell on his face and started praying to God. He said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to talk to you for a minute. Moses went up and started talking to God. God was in the cloud. The Bible says that he spoke face to face with them as a friend. They also told Moses, no man can see me and live. I don't know how Enoch got close to God but I know he was close enough that when he said Lord he answered I believe he walked with him not just in the cool of the day from sun up to sundown. now nowhere do I find that Elijah walked that close to God so what's Enoch capable of whatever God wants him to be capable of but we're talking about outside of the Lord Jesus Christ outside of John the Baptist maybe some of the apostles these fellows are right up there on the list of people that have faith that can move mountains these guys are right up there on the list of this is how high up on the list they are God picked them 
as the two preachers that he wanted during the middle of the end times and the tribulation. They got to be pretty good preachers. But how good preachers are they? But it says that these two were the olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. God says if you touch them, I'm going to send fire out of their mouths to devour you. It says, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. It doesn't say he's going to hurt them, it's going to end them. It says they have power to shut up heaven, verse number 6, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. What's that mean? It means in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, no rain's fallen from heaven. It says, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Well, how often are they going to send plagues whenever God tells them to send one? But God's given a lot of authority and a lot of power to these guys. It says, and when they shall have finished their testimony. These guys are going to have enough God on them that even an all devoted, completely wicked world isn't going to be able to do anything to these fellows until they get done preaching. Doesn't say that God completely hedges them in because it says that if somebody hurt them, they're not invulnerable. They're just human like you and me. But it says that they're going to finish their prophesying. They're going to be able to say it like the Apostle Paul, I fought a good fight and finished my course. But it says, When they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. How much God these fellas got on them that nobody else on the earth is going to be able to do anything about it except for Satan himself. You sure, Jordan? Pretty sure. Till God says, your time's up, your time's not up. Then in verse number 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Now didn't I just tell you earlier that the holy city was Jerusalem? But yet this verse says that spiritually this city is called Sodom and Egypt. Egypt and Sodom. What's that mean, Brother Jordan? Well, he already clarified that spiritually it is called. We're not talking about the geographic location. We're talking about what symbolically this place will represent at this point. These literally are the two candlesticks or the two lights that are left in the world, these two prophets, that are reminding the rest of the world God's still God. You can't win. You can get rid of his people, but you can't get rid of the 144,000 because God said they're going to make it. Every day, their very existence is a reminder to the rest of the world that they're going to lose. Nothing can touch them, but all around them, the place that was once the holy city has spiritually been turned into Sodom and Egypt. Well, Sodom in your Bible is a representation of lasciviousness and completely giving the, yourself over to the flesh of fleshly pl pleasures. No inhibition to go out and do what you want. You don't fear the consequences. You're only concerned with what you want to do and going and doing it. And Egypt in the Bible is always a picture of the world, of carnality. What has the world turned... I mean, this is the place, Jerusalem. This is God's city, for lack of a better term. And they've turned it over into what? A complete and total representation of carnality and the world and the ideologies of the devil. My right to my claim to myself, pride, boastfulness, sinfulness. The city will become everything that God hates. 
except for what? These two prophets. Can you imagine all of the pomp and circumstance and celebration of what they've turned the world into? All the gold and all the fancy jewels and fancy dress and everything. And then these two guys that are wearing potato bags, right, keep walking around the city preaching that what they're doing is wrong and they're going to come face to face with an angry God. And then one day, finally, the devil says, we're going to war against the two preacher boys. And then finally, God lifts the hedge and allows them to die. It says, their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Just in case you had any doubt about where he was actually talking about. Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. What are they going to do? They're going to put them on display. They're going to line them up as in, you know, in mockery. Man's known to do that. For a long time, men have been putting the heads of their enemies on stakes to taunt the enemy. To say, look at what we did. What are they going to do with these two fellows? They're going to have a party that they're dead. These are the two guys that shut up the heavens for three and a half years where it wouldn't rain. These are the guys that if you walked up and you punched them, guess what happened? You got consumed with fire out of their mouth. They saw them as the ultimate thorn in their side and now they're gone. I'm going to have a party. It goes further than that. It says, And they that dwell upon the earth, in verse number 10, shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts to one another. What's that sound like? Sounds a whole lot like Christmas. Well, we celebrate the birth of Christ. They're celebrating the death of God on the earth. They said, hey, nobody here to tell us that we're wrong anymore. Then it goes on to say, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. What happened? They had died once and they was able to go on. They met the requirement. It was appointed unto men once to die. But what happened? God took them back. It says, come up hither. It says, and they ascended unto heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. How long were they dead? Three and a half days. Now what measurement are we using? Are we using the old measurement back in Bible days where from sun up to sundown was a day? Once the sun went down, that was one night? I don't know. I don't know if we're talking about stopwatch time. Don't know if we're talking about measurements of the sun, but for three and a half days, they did. How long was Jesus in the grave? It only took him three. Three days and three nights. What he's saying, Brother Jordan, God's making it clear that they're not Christ, but he's also making it clear that they're associated with him. They aren't God, but their God was able to raise them from the dead. Then how does he take them home to glory? Black manner with Christ. They went up in a cloud. What'd God do? God said, I'm sending my limo for them. This isn't something that they conjured up. I've only found where there's one other person up to this point that got a ride out of here in a cloud. That's Jesus. It says that we'll meet him in the clouds during the rapture. But the only person that ever rode on one was Jesus. And Jesus says, send my car to go get him. God takes him out of here saying, these guys, you tried to get rid of them and you couldn't take them. Now they're leaving because I want them gone. Well, it says, And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld him. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, 
and the tenth part of the city fell. Why do you think God had to measure it in the beginning with a reed or a rod? So that he knew exactly one tenth of it had fallen. It says, And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. Now that key word there, remnant. Whenever you find that word in the Bible, it's referring to those that God has saved. He always promised to have what? A remnant. The devil's people aren't a, pri aren't a part of the remnant. God has always promised that he would have his people on his earth. They promised that the gospel would continue to propagate until what? Until the rapture happens. And then gospel, not going to help you no more. You've got to get to go through. You have to find favor with God through the way he said to in the tribulation. You've got to be willing to be martyred. And you will have to die a martyr's death. Your faith in the tribulation period is going to have to be pretty strong. But it says here in this verse that a tenth part of the city fell, that 7,000 of the devil's crowd were slain, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, But we're at the tail end by the time these fellows are taken out of here. It's been three and a half years in the second half of it. What's that mean? They're taken out of here right before the seventh trumpet blows, which is what it says at the end of this. Who's the ones that are praising God? It ain't the devil's crowd. Remember, they bought in hook, line, and sinker to what the devil's preaching. They're not going to worship God. Who's worshiping God? The remnant is. The 144,000 in the wilderness. The ones that will run out of their home and he sees, or they see God strike down the city with a great earthquake where a tenth of the city falls and they are affrighted. What's that mean? It means that they're fearful. I don't believe that they're afraid of God. I believe that that is a reverential fear. They see the hand of God come down and strike the earth and what do they do it causes them to reverence God more but also I don't know what kind of hells and terrors and everything else they're going to have witnessed by this point perhaps they don't know that it was God that sent the earthquake and I know they're in the wilderness but how far is the wilderness? Well, by the time the devil circles them in, they're in the valley of Megiddo. They're not that far away. Maybe they were affrighted because the ground started shaking underneath them. I don't think that it's an insult to say that these people were affrighted. I don't think it's a comment on their faith. I don't think that it's... I mean, they've forsaken everything except God and gone to the wilderness. They solely depend upon the hand of God to meet their needs every day. These people are all in. I think that word of Friday means they were shocked. But then when they realized what happened, what did it say they did? They gave glory to the God of heaven. Then verse number 14, The second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Everything from the first half, first, well, 60% of chapter number 11, chapter number 10, and chapter number 9 all happen in the sixth trumpet when it sounds. And you'll recall that fifth trumpet, before that sounded, there was an angel who told John the first four were bad but the last three is worse. And the fifth one was bad. This one was worse than the last one. What do you think that the seventh is going to be? 
But I do believe that in this account, we have two groups of people that show tremendous faith. I don't know what it's going to be like for those two prophets to walk in the midst of complete idolatry, lasciviousness. You think you got a bad walking around in the world today? I read that the Bible says that in the last days it'll be as the days of Noah where man's thoughts were evil continually. The only thing that kept them from, or keeps them from acting on that is the presence of the Spirit of God. But the Holy Ghost is out of here in this chapter. Not only are men's thoughts evil continually, their actions are evil continually. We just saw literally the, hell, or the top taken off of hell and all manner of beasts and creatures coming out of it. And these fellas are going to live in it day in and day out for three and a half years. I don't know what toll that's going to take on them psychologically, emotionally. I know that some are going to be consumed with fire out of their mouths. You know what that means? People are going to try and hurt them. I've already told you. They've got the power of God on them, but they're not invulnerable. The only thing that keeps them from being killed is the fact that God says they can't be killed. I can't imagine what things the world's going to think up on how to hurt these fellows. But yet through it all, what do you find? Every day they clothe themselves in sackcloth. What do they do? While the rest of the world is puffing up and filling themselves with pride before God, they continue to remain humble. They say it's not about what's on the outside, it's about what's on the inside. Jeremiah said that he had a fire shut up in his bones. Well, these fellows, God lets a little bit of that fire that he shut up in them out every time somebody tries to hurt them. They say what we got on the inside is alive. It's real. It has power, not because we are powerful, but because the one that put it in us is powerful. Their faith takes them through what? Through literally the worst time that will ever be upon the face of the earth. And while the woman in the wilderness, which we're going to hear about in the next chapter, while Israel is fleeing and hiding from the Antichrist and his people, these two fellows are smack dab on the middle of Main Street in Jerusalem where they're going to take it over and make it into a monument of what they believe is important they're not hiding they're front and center daily they have to wake up and do what? the same thing that you and I do choose to put their faith into God for that day they don't get credit for the day before how hard is it going to be so hard that God thought the only two fellows that can endure that are going to be Enoch and Elijah. That's why he took them. He recruited them. Now don't knock off on Elijah. Elijah had his moment of doubt. That was when he was alive the first time. Before God took him. After that, he never doubted God again. And in truth, he did not doubt God. He doubted people. Go and look at it. He said, Lord, how are these people? After you just sent fire down from heaven, there's still a crowd that that evil queen, they choose to follow her instead of following you. But after that moment under the juniper tree, what do you find? Elijah never wavered again. I believe spiritually he never did waver, or else God wouldn't have sent him the food. He didn't denounce God. He didn't turn his back on God. What happened? He got like you and me for a minute. Where he said, Lord, you can't help these people. Jonah thought the same thing, except Jonah never got over it. He was still bitter that God chose to send revival. What did God tell Elijah? He said, I've still got a whole crowd hadn't bowed a knee, hadn't worshipped. 
So while Elijah's going through all this in the Great Tribulation, you know what he's thinking of? God's still got 144,000 out there in the wilderness. Ain't bowed a knee to the Antichrist. He says, if they can do it, I can do it. God's seen me safe this, this, you know, thus far. It's going to be fine. What's God been telling Elijah and Enoch for thousands of years? Everything they need to know to preach during the tribulation. What are they going to be preaching? Whatever God tells them to. Enoch got so close to God that he cared more about God than anything on this earthly planet. There was nothing here that could satisfy him. So what did God do? He took him. You think Enoch's going to be impressed with all that he sees in this city? No, Enoch's only been impressed by one thing his entire life, and that was God. These fellows have great faith, great determination, great resiliency. But God's no respecter of persons, I find. You know, that means God can fill you with just as much purpose and resilience and faith. If you allow Him to mold and make you, He can make you just as much of a defiance to the devil and his crowd and what they're trying to do today as He will for these fellows during the Great Tribulation. You know what the difference is? These two fellows allowed Him to do it. They didn't get in the way. Both of them, literally, their testimony is that they wanted what God wanted so much that they were willing to lose everything in the world. You know why Christians aren't on fire the way that we hear about in olden days and from the Bible? It's because they want things in the world more than they want God. But these two fellows, they said, Lord, take it all. I just want you. And God took them. But then we see another great testimony of faith, the remnant, even on the run. Knowing that there is not just a target on their back, everybody in the world eventually is going to be not only their enemy, but actively hunting these people. And how long do they evade them? Right before the clouds open up and Jesus comes back with us on white horses. How long are they going to get away? They're going to make it to the end. But every day, on the run. Because if you stay one place too long, guess what? They're going to find you. What are they doing? They're playing the world's best game of hide and go seek. Because the devil and his crowd can't find them. Why? Because God don't want them to be found. But every day, They don't know where their meal's coming from. They don't know where water's coming from. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. These prophets are going to be able to turn water to blood, not to mention all the things we already saw where God turns a third of the water bitter with that star called Wormwood, where a third of the fish die. You put something dead in water and see how long it takes before that water will make you sick if you drink it. And there's dead things in all the water all around the world. Every second of every day, they're living on faith. Why? Because they have made themselves dependent upon God. Some people are with God or hooked up with God when it's convenient, when the timing's right, when the stars align. You know when these people are lined up with God? All the time. doesn't matter what's going on down there in the city how good of a time it looks like all the fun that they claim they're having these people are purposed to be pilgrims in the wilderness and choose day by day to face the carnal fear of not knowing where everything's going to come from but spiritually having the faith that if God sent it yesterday he'll send it today because he promised We use the term living by faith. Right as an anecdote. Or as a goal that you can strive towards. No, it's reality for these people. 
You know what the problem, why most Christians don't live by faith? Because they're not desperate enough to. God's been too good to us. When faith is all you got, that's all you got to use. But God's blessed us enough that we don't need faith. Why? Because we're not desperate enough. These people need faith. And because they need it, their faith is so strong that it gets them through the worst three and a half years ever recorded in man's history while the whole world is trying to hunt them down and kill them. But you had a bad day at the office because your boss was honoring? Some people don't have faith to make it through a phone call, let alone through anything like this. They choose every day to essentially live as beggars, to live as homeless people, to live on the run as vagabonds, on the lamb, because they'd rather be right with God than have anything that the world has for them. And you know what? They make it. They win. Why? Because they pick God over the world. They chose Jehovah over Lucifer. But they win because they kept exercising their faith. They wouldn't have made it if one day they said, I don't feel like running anymore. You know what? I'm tired of not knowing where the next meal is going to come from. I'm going to go down there and eat something. Even if they kill me, they might have enough decency to give me a last meal. They don't do that. Why? Because their faith is all that they have. If we got back to the point where our faith was all that we had and that there was nothing in the world that held any interest or spark or desire... God would turn this world upside down again. You want to know what it takes to bring revival? You've got to be like these two groups of people. You've got to have faith and desire and hunger for the things of God. That's why God's able to do great things with these people. Not because they're any different than us, but because they have great faith. That's all God ever expected. Because without it, it's impossible to please Him. And their faith was so strong that what? God chose to tell us about it before it happened to be an inspiration to us today. Yeah, we've got it worse today than they've ever had it back then. Well, maybe there's more things to distract us. Maybe there's more titles for the same thing, but there's nothing new under the sun. You know, you're facing today the same spirits that they've been wrestling against and spiritual wickedness in high places and we don't wrestle against flesh and blood or any of the things that they create. Christians today are still wrestling against the same thing that Christians wrestled against back then. It's called the devil wanting to wipe us out. Trying to silence us, trying to rob you of your faith. And the fight is whether or not you're going to give in to the carnal man or to feed the spiritual man, to take up your cross and follow him. It's the same struggle. The faces have changed. The maps have new names on them and the lines have been redrawn, but it's the same fight. And it's the same fight that these people are going to be fighting in the end times. The fight is whether you choose God and then how much you're going to trust God. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.